the single most powerful insight I took from Phil Knight's biography about Nike called Shoe Dog is this from its founder. Phil said, people sensing my belief wanted some of that belief for themselves. Belief, I decided, is irresistible. Hi, I'm Park Howell and welcome to the 414th edition of the Business of Story, where for the very first time, we explore the importance of expressing your beliefs through the stories you tell so that you too can become irresistible. If you are a regular listener to the Business of Story, then you know that we've just launched our first mastery course called the ABTs of Business Communications. Our exclusive cohort is learning the cornerstone of business communications with the and but therefore agile narrative framework, which I believe is the DNA of all storytelling. The ABT uses the three forces of story to make all of your messages land right the first time, every time, making you a more confident, persuasive, and effective communicator. If you missed joining the four-week deliberate practice mastery course, no worries. You can still take the ABTs of Agile Communications quick online course at businessofstory.com forward slash ABT. Hear how others believe the messaging marvel of the ABT is working for them. In terms of the ABT course, I love it. I love the simplicity of it. Um, I love how easy it is to use and how well things are described and presented to you. So I'm looking forward to, to completing it. Thank you. To me, the most interesting part is the but. I think we're always looking for research that sets up tension in a way that can kind of grab people and maybe surprise them. So I love that idea of kind of establishing a shared vision, demonstrating maybe an obstacle or a contradiction, and then showing how you could help them pave a path forward. I love it. Found the ABT and how simple it was and how applicable it was. It completely changed the game for me, right? I, I heard Park Howell on one of Christopher Lockhead's podcasts and it immediately made sense to me, read his book, uh, Narrative Gym for Business, and immediately started practicing it. And I've been able to implement story now into social media posts, texts, emails, uh, conversation, and it's just greatly increased my ability to communicate and persuade for the things that I really, really care about. Hey, Dan and Malstaff here from Boss Mom, and I absolutely love using the ABT method. Park is brilliant. It simplifies a way for me to look at what I'm saying and actually say it in a way that entices my audience to take action and fall in love with everything I'm doing. The ABT is indispensable in my business. My clients love it. I was actually um, just on a call before this with, uh, I'm doing a coaching certification right now for girls. And one of them said, she's like, oh, you're on, you're going to get on with Park. She's like, I loved that thing. She's like the ABT. I've totally started using it. Everybody I tell about loves it and you should love it too. Don't wait for our next mastery course to up your storytelling game. Start now at businessofstory.com forward slash ABT. Then you'll know how to share your beliefs in a much more engaging and empowering way. That's businessofstory.com forward slash ABT. I look forward to seeing you there. As you'll hear today from an amazing professional who spent nearly two decades in sales and marketing at IBM and who helps women ignite their growth by designing lives and creating businesses or careers with intention, belief in yourself and your offering is the only way to sell and grow. What came through your conviction and your belief that that offer that you're cre that you've created is amazing. And that's what people are buying. They're buying your belief, right? They're buying that belief that's coming through in that email, in your messages. That's what they're buying. They don't know what's on the other side of that course. I always say people buy belief. They don't buy the course. They don't buy the program. They can't know. It's almost like a brick wall. 
they can't know what's on the other side of that brick wall. They can't, they've never seen it. They haven't gone through it yet. So why are they giving you money? They're giving you money based on belief. And I just love that you just shared that because that's exactly what I, I always am sharing with our clients is that your emails have a, a frequency to them. You know, I'm not yeah. super woo, but I'm woo enough. Like I, th- there's an energy behind your emails. People feel it, whether they can, they can't put their finger on it. They just know. And that belief comes through and it requires us to self-coach ourselves on the energy backing our actions. Because it really, really matters. Julie Ciardi is a business and mindset coach on a mission to help ignite women to design lives they love rather than living life by default. She hosts the Ignite Her Mind podcast and provides a free community called Ignite Her Society. Julie believes that women start their dream business using her signature Now Goal formula, which you'll learn about in today's show. We also explore the four things that every entrepreneur must do to stay in business. You'll learn how to create the mindset required for your next big goal by uncovering what working on your mindset really means. And that success comes down to a simple formula that we have never been taught. So please welcome to the business of story, Julie Ciardi. Hello, Julie. Welcome so much to the business of story. Thanks, Mark. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. Now, you have really carved out a marvelous niche in the consulting coaching business, especially to help ignite women in their careers and so forth. And you have had quite a career leading up to this. So I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about you and your backstory how it has brought you to where you are today, specifically on the show. And we are really going to focus then the show about belief, because in some of the background you sent me about yourself, belief is such a critical keystone, cornerstone, whatever you want to call it, to us sharing our visions, our missions, our purpose, our products, our services, or whatever, to get people to buy into what we believe and share those same values so that we can build our companies and have the impact in the world we seek. So, long-winded way of saying, welcome. Tell us more about you. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm excited for this conversation because, you know, obviously story is an incredible vehicle to bring that belief to life and to really create that feeling. Because I believe belief is a feeling, right? And stories create that feeling. So I'm excited about uh, our discussion today. But yeah, I I have a very, very kind of boring, typical background where I'm sure just like yourself, when I was leaving college, there was no online entrepreneur world. There were no podcasts. There was not this opportunity that exists today. Um, But being ambitious and type A, it was, okay, I've got to, you know, do really great in school and go land that big job and, you know, for a corporation and, you know, just follow that typical path of, you know, getting landing that good job and then really working to create a career working for someone else. You know, the word entrepreneur back when I was growing up, it, it didn't really exist. I mean, people owned businesses. I think I, I kind of more understood that. But everyone that I knew that had a business was, you know, the person that had, you know, the hair salon in town or the mechanic that owned his own shop or someone that owned a restaurant. You know, there wasn't, it wasn't a path that was really talked about in a lot of ways. But I share that by saying that, but deep inside my soul, my purpose, I always knew that I was meant to do something on my own. And so it was always this gap, but kind of had to ignore that for a while and just kept going down the path. You know, I got my MBA and landed a, a job at IBM and stayed there for, gosh, you know, 17, 18 years. And you know, it was pretty successful in that career. I was in marketing and sales at IBM. I became a vice president there by the age of 39. I was really good at what I I was doing. I think the thing I loved the most was mentoring women. So I was doing that even then in my, my roles at IBM. But there was something missing, something very big missing. And, and it really was around, you know, freedom and fulfillment. And that's really what led me to continue to explore my true calling and what has landed me now with my own company, which I've had now for, 
gosh, you know, over five years. So, so you had that one main <laughs> career gig there at IBM. I'm sure you learned loads in that process in sales and marketing there. And it was leaving then that large corporation to start your own small thing at first. I mean, did you not have a job in the interim or did you just dive headlong uh, into it? I love sharing this. I love sharing this part of the story because I think that we've had this, you know, societal norms are you when you leave, you know, college, let's say, and you get the job or whatever it is, you're always on this succession upwards, right? It's like you get the starter home and then you get the bigger home and then, you know, you're get, you're always getting the better cars and life's, you know, the better vacations and all the things. And that's exactly how things played out, you know, like did well, kept getting promoted and kept growing. And my husband, he's retired now um, from being a police officer, but he was, you know, first responder police officer. I was the primary breadwinner. And there was a lot of weight on my shoulders. You know, we had this big, beautiful home and great vacations and all the things you can imagine, you know, have with three kids. And, but I wasn't happy. I wasn't feeling fulfilled. And we get into this, you know, what I call the lifestyle income trap. So you don't have the gap, you make plenty of money, but you're in this trap now. Because how do you get yourself out of that high paying career right? And start this business. I mean, I was a vice president there. It was challenging. I was building my business on the side, but I had to take the leap because I couldn't do both to, for, for a long period of time. And so I, I take all care of all the bills and I do all that stuff, all the money. So I made a spreadsheet. I sat down with my husband and I said, all right, he was so supportive. He's like, I know you want to pursue your dreams, all the things. And I said, listen, I ran all the numbers. And so in order for me to start my own business and do what I want to do, we're going to have to sell the house. <laughs> and he was like, okay. And you know what? My kids, my husband, they've been amazing. We sold our house six years ago. Um, we downsized a bit. We decided to make some different choices for just a period of time. So it was almost like we were on this, like, this speedway, if you will, right? And I, we decided to just take a little exit. For, and, and actually enter a different speedway. And that's what we did. And so we really made some pretty bold life choices and moves so that I could pursue this dream. But I didn't want to go get another job. I didn't want to do anything interim. I, I really believed in myself and knew that if I could just have the runway, I could make it work. Well, he obviously believed in your vision too, but what was his first reaction when you said, honey, we got to sell the home? I think he's used to me coming up with kind of crazy ideas, but it is like, what are you talking about? You know, and of course, I think things through pretty, pretty deeply. So I had already looked up, you know, like what it was going to mean, like some other choices. And, you know, it's funny, you know, you start to bring into question what you really value. And, you know, was it, you know, a 4,000 square foot house or could we be even happier in a 2,500 square foot house? I mean, this is, it's, it's just stuff, you know, and so... He really, it was a hard conversation, took a little time for him to kind of digest it. But just like we're about to talk about, he bought my belief, mm -hmm. right? My kids bought my belief. They were younger at the time. And my big requirement um, in moving was I just knew that they needed the exact same size bedrooms that they had in the other house. That's all they care about, right? The kids love their bedrooms, especially teenagers. And we moved two miles down the road. I actually, I'm, I'm st we're still in that house. I love it so much. And it's been one of the best decisions that we ever could have, have, have made. But it was a hard decision. And it takes sometimes one person to go first. And again, selling that belief of what that future vision was going to be. And I can tell you right now that my kids now being, you know, almost 20, 17 and nine years old, if you ask them on a podcast, an interview, like, so what was it like moving and now, right? They'd be like, it was hard at first, but we've seen, we've never seen my mom so happy. Or they'd say, you know, we, we, we have had my mom around so much more mm -hmm. than when she was a vice president at IBM, you know? So it all works out, but it's got to take one person to kind of lead with that belief. <laughs> Well, and what you're doing when you are sharing that belief, you essentially are sharing a fictional story about what tomorrow could be. And that's the beautiful thing about the homo sapiens brain is we plan, organize, and act in stories. 
And, you know, everything, whenever we're selling anything, we are telling a fictional story about how tomorrow can be better if you just do this with us today. And then, of course, we've got to deliver on those promises. But it doesn't, it, it, it always starts with that belief. You, as the storyteller, have to first have the passion and the conviction to demonstrate that belief so that they are going to buy into it. And I mean, buy into it in the most positive ways. You're not trying to hoodwink them here. You're not lying about it. You're not making stuff up. You're saying, here's what I believe that we can do together. And, you know, in your case, you had to sell the house. A lot of times we have to give up something in order to gain something, don't we? Oh, 100%. And I feel like we, we, again, as homo sapiens, we like to and have actually an easier time coming up with very elaborate negative stories. It's called worry, right? Like I always, I, I had the opportunity to work with Bob Proctor and, you know, we would talk about imagination and worry is just another form of imagination, mm-hmm. right? We're thinking about something that could go wrong. We're telling a story of the worst case scenario. And we find that so much easier than actually doing the same thing about what we do want to create, what we do want our life to look like, what we do want the outcome to be. And the crazy part is it's just a choice and it's just an awareness Mm -hmm. that you actually get to decide what that narrative is. And it's really powerful. (laughs) Without a doubt. So now you find yourself with your new business and your new book, The Standout Breakout Formula. Do I have that right? Yes. Yeah, Stand Up Breakout Formula. That was one of the, it was really, that book was very much about, it was almost it. We talk about belief, right? That was my way of being able to reach my dream clients before they ever worked with me so that they would know who I am, how, how I, what I believe in, how I can help them. The book that I'm writing now is going to be more of the, the story and all of those things. But that book there, that was very much about that whole point of belief really reaching my dream clients to help them see where I could help them. But here's the funny thing. So when I left, when I left IBM and started this business and all of that, listen, people aren't always super upfront. It was not easy. It was eight, it was a really hard 18 months because while my husband may have bought into my belief fairly easily, uh, about maybe six months in was like, okay, So where is this, you know, multiple six figure million dollar business, right? It was like he kind of not being an entrepreneur, didn't really know what went into it either. And so, you know, interestingly enough, and I love that our theme here is belief. I had to continue to fuel the belief in myself when things actually got really hard. And I'm really honest about that. So it sounds all pretty and beautiful that, oh, you know, we sold the house and I started this business and all these things. But those 18 months were really hard and probably the hardest time in my marriage. And I can tell you right now that you would have to take me back kicking and screaming to go work for someone else after having started my own business. Mm -hmm. But it was those are the conversations like, shouldn't you update your LinkedIn and start to like, you know, talk to your connections, maybe go back to work for, you know, IBM or another kind of company. I'm like, no. And it was hard for about 18 months. And I had to continuously fuel the belief in myself and continue to paint that picture and tell the story of what I believed was I was building, what I was creating and not stopping, even though it was really, really hard. And so I like to just share that because you may have listeners who, you know, they have a dream, there's something they're trying to build and they're stuck in that spot. And that was one of the hardest places I've ever been in. And that really going in and finding that belief in yourself, you, you, you can't always get it from the outside. You're not going to, even your biggest fans may not have that total belief and continuing to do that work of building that belief in you is going to be the most important part of getting through that hard yeah. time. Now, how does belief work into your, what you call the now goal formula? What is that formula and how does belief drive that? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of the now goal. I, I, I learned the concept from Bob Proctor himself, where he was, would always talk about having like this big, scary, impossible goal. And so I call it the now goal. And the reason I call it the now goal is it's that big, scary, impossible thing you're working on right now. It's not something you even know how it's going to all play out, 
but it's so big. And so for me at the time, my very first now goal was, you know, I'm so happy and grateful now that I've left corporate. That was my goal while still in corporate. And what happens when you declare a big, scary goal like that and a big, impossible goal and the way we work with our clients is everyone has a now goal. They've worked through that. And when we go on coaching calls, you know, it's like, okay, what's your now goal? Tell everyone your now goal. And we we work around that because just declaring it, we write it on a, a, a three by five card. We always have it available right near us because it becomes the lens through which you look at everything. So in order for you to go after a big goal that seems impossible, the key ingredient is belief and faith. I mean, it has to be. You don't know how it's going to play out. If you know exactly how it's going to play out, it's just a plan. It's it's not this big dream, right? It's just a plan and you can do it. A now goal, it requires you to actually become a, the next version of yourself. You have to have a transformation. Julie, that was vice president at IBM, is not the same person that's sitting here right now and speaking to you and to your audience at all. I mean, I actually want to go back and hug her because I'm like, wow, like, great job. High five, like that you did that leap. But who I've become in that process, it's, it's I, I can't even recognize myself and how I used to think and how I used to feel. So we use the now goal to really help the transformation from the inside out of how you need to start thinking, how you need to start feeling, really who you need to be. And I think that the, the problem that we tend to, or trap we tend to fall into when we have a big goal we're going after is we say this, all right, what do I need to do? Always go, what do I need to do? I'm going to find someone that can teach me exactly what I need to do. And you do need to learn. You need to know how to start a business. And you need to know marketing and sales and strategy and all those things. But at the end of the day, if that's all you needed, everyone would be successful. It's who you're being, mm-hmm. your thinking, your feeling, your attitude, your mindset, who you're showing up as. That's the key. And so when we work on these now goals, we work on actually shifting who you need to become. And that requires a ton of belief in yourself that you can actually become the person that has that result. Yeah. That you're well, it's the stories you tell yourself, is it not? I mean, <laughs> faith, belief and faith is all about storytelling internally. Well, and externally, but it starts internally. The other thing that I think is interesting is when you make a big leap of faith, like you did leaving IBM, selling your home, moving your family, and then starting your own thing because you could see it and you believed in it. And I'm sure a lot of people around you thought, what in the hell is Julie doing? Why would she give up this VP job? I'm sure she's making good money. Why would we do this? But it plays to that you know negativity bias in us and the fact that we are way more likely to spend a lot more effort to not lose something versus to gain something. You know, we love that status quo of, you know, maybe I'm okay here, VP of IBM. But as you said earlier, it was a rather soul sucking. So you had to do something about it. That was your inciting incident. And you and then, you know, it gets worse before it gets better, doesn't it? Because like, oh my God, I've got to go tell my husband, gee, honey, we got to sell the house. Oh, kids, guess what? We are moving to a smaller house. We are downsizing. And then you and yourself are probably asking, am I doing the right thing by everybody? Totally, totally. But here's the thing, right? It's like we're we're meant to grow. I, I really think that what happens is that our whole life, we've got we've got these now goals. We don't even realize they're now goals, but they're now goals, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to graduate high school and I want to do really well. And I'm going to get into a great college. And then from the college, I want to get the great job. And then I want to build that family maybe and or whatever it may be. Those are all now goals. They're impossible things you've never done before. But what happens is is that we kind of get into the rhythm of life and we kind of get lulled into this lukewarmness where we're like, okay, I've got this job now, which is what happened to me. And I was in this, in this career. And I think it's why, you know, we call it, you know, quote unquote, midlife crisis. I like to call it midlife creation. We stopped creating. We stopped. And when you stop creating, you, you, you die inside. Yeah. I see it. So often, and I think that when, as long as we're creating and we're and we're creating something, we're growing. And when we're growing, we feel more alive than we ever have before. And it's really, really a, a, a thing that I live by is that that I'm never going to stop growing until I'm I'm no longer here. And I think that that's what's so powerful. And it, so it's uncomfortable when we're going to grow, and it, growth is uncomfortable. But 
it, I think what I've learned, and I learned, it took me longer than I would have liked. I spent two decades, right, in corporate where I wish I had learned this earlier. Can't go back, but I know that part of me was dying inside because I was no longer growing. Yeah. Now, you have learned a lot in the process, both from IBM and building your own things. And one of the notes you sent me to discuss, and I'd really love to hear your opinion on this, are like the four things that businesses have to do to remain in business so that they can thrive. What are those four things? Well, it's interesting, you know, having come from getting my MBA and then being at IBM for so long, when I came into the online space, I was fascinated by what was being taught and what was kind of being left out and also how overly complicated things became. So again, I'm more my where I really focus is, you know, female coaches, female service um, providers, you know, on, entrepreneurs who heavily use online marketing in their, you know, for their business. So, so much was being taught of like, you know, how to you know, use Instagram and how to use YouTube or how to use LinkedIn and not some of the basic business fundamentals. And I liked, I like, I'm all about simple. I like to keep things very, very simple. And when I think about whether it was at IBM or the very first business I ever started with, which was a brick and mortar boutique, whole other story. And then my coaching business and every single person I've ever worked with, it's the same four things. Okay. We, the first two are marketing. One, you got to bring in new leads always. Two, you have to nurture those leads. That's marketing. Three, you got to make sales. And then four, you've got to deliver. You've got to deliver, right, your service, your product to the point where, and I always say, to create clients for life. And here's the here's where I see the gap. That That's so fundamental and basic. But let me tell you, the more that I teach this to female entrepreneurs, that are, they haven't heard it before. They all are in, well, I just got to get the viral post that happens on Instagram or the YouTube or what it's like, no, that's not how this works. And I think the, the piece that I see missing the most, to be honest, and I always say that the only thing standing between an entrepreneur and a client is marketing. Sales is easy when the marketing works, mm -hmm. but what happens with marketing that I think people like forget, it's not linear. It is very much a relationship and it's very much over time through things like story and developing that belief. But I always say you want to love on a client before they ever pay you a dollar. To me, that's nurture. It's not about, you know, I saw it was in my email, in email inbox the other day. One of the subject lines was the one funnel to rake in customers and like just every cell in my body like reacted. <laughs> it's about serving, right? It's about how do I, if it said one funnel to serve more clients than you ever have, I might have opened it, right? But this is where, this is the mentality. It's like, how do I, how do I, how do I, how do I get more money? How do I make more money? How do I get more leads? When you can say, how can I love on my dream client before they ever pay me a dollar? Magic starts to happen. Magic starts to happen. And this is what we teach our clients. So it's funny, we were talking about building that belief and 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 painting that picture or that story of what's possible. I was just working with a client the other day and before she ever worked with a client, her thoughts were, am I the right person? She's no client, she never had a client for a brand new coach. She's trying to land her first client. And her thoughts were, oh my gosh, am I gonna be able to, you know, am I the right person? I, you know, I'm feeling like imposter. Am I going to be able to get the client a result? And then when she landed her first client, her thoughts changed to, oh my gosh, I'm the perfect person for this client. And all it took was landing this one client. And so now as she's going out in her marketing, she's like, okay, I, I, she's now showing up, right? As the person that's the right person for her client. And in her language and in her messaging and her stories, She's showing up in a way where she's loving on these clients before they've ever paid her a dollar. She's giving them value. She's helping them. She's letting them see who she really is and how she can help them. And that's what's landing consults now, right? So it's like these little shifts. It's not She didn't have a, a post that went viral, right? It's just her belief in herself grew. Her thoughts started to change. How then she showed up in her marketing started to become believable that she was someone that could help her dream client. 
we never complicate this. It's interesting because those four <laughs> points seem so rudimentary, don't they, Julie? I mean, you got to develop some leads. Once you get those leads, you got to nurture those leads. Then you got to close those leads, and then you got to deliver on those leads. I mean, is that kind of like one on one? You would think. You would think. But here's what I'm seeing. It, it it literally pains me what I'm seeing. What I'm seeing is that so many, especially like newer entrepreneurs, are putting so much of their money, like investing before they've even really made a lot of money, into these silver bullets. Mm-hmm. Like this is going to be the thing, but really it's these four things. And if you're not doing these four things and, and it, it blows my mind at how rudimentary it is. However, however, here's where people want to go. I'm going to open my business and then I want to start delivering my services. I'm going to open my business. And I want to start delivering to clients. They want to get there because yeah. that's what they started the business for. That's what they're good at. That's their craft. That's what they, the, obviously the goal is to work with clients. But if you don't understand that marketing is two phases of lead gen and nurture, and what is your strategy for each of those things, right? And all the strategies work. What works for you? But are you doing all these things? And so what I I tend to find is that people are doing maybe a few things, but not all the things. You've got to do lead gen and nurture. You've got to create sales and have a sales strategy. And then you then you can deliver all you want. That's probably where you're going to be the best. You're probably going to shine at the delivery mm-hmm. because that's why you started this business. But start to fall in love. I always say start to fall in love with marketing and sales rather than like, oh, this is something else I have to do. Or people want to outsource it so quick. But you can't outsource your marketing to a social media manager if you don't really know your message, if you don't really have those convictions in there, if you don't have the story right in the belief. Yeah. If that's not in there, you cannot outsource that. You can't outsource belief. So I've got to ask you that algorithm over your shoulder that I'm looking at on your whiteboard. T plus F times A to the third equals R. What is that? Yes. So this is our now goal formula in a formula, right? So if you think about it, I'll just kind of explain it for those that are listening. So we are, we're going after a result, right? So the result is the end game, right? The now goal, this result that we're going after. So how do we get to it? And we talked about this a little earlier. Everyone wants to go to what do I need to do? Mm -hmm. They want to go to the A, which is action. Just give me the action plan. Give me the action plan and I'm going to get the result that I want. It doesn't quite work like that. How do we know? Because if that was the truth, that every person selling something online, every client that they sold to would have success, Mm -hmm. right? All the strategies work. So what's the difference? What's unique? Well, it's the person themselves. It's the being. It's their thoughts and their feelings. So the T and the F are your thoughts and your feelings. I like to think of thoughts and feelings as who you're being. It could be your attitude, mindset. It's all the same thing, right? It's who you're showing up as. It's the it's the energy. It's the frequency behind the actions that you're taking. And so like in any good mathematical formula, what do we do first? <laughs> we do what's in the parentheses. And the thoughts and the feelings, the T and the F are in the parentheses. If we do not manage our thoughts, our feelings, our attitude, our mindset ahead of the actions that we are taking, we're not going to get the result we want. And I'll give you a great example. So I had a client who came for coaching and she said, I don't know, Julie, I'm so confused. I you know, was running this in-person event locally. I was trying to invite you know, as many people as I could to come to the event because, of course, you know, at the event, She was also going to be, you know, sharing her services and everything. So she was putting a lot of pressure on this event to also drive income for her business. And she had a lot of limiting beliefs around reaching out to people and being icky and, you know, DMing people and all these things. And I knew this. So I kind of knew where this was going to go. She said, "I, I, I made a list of like, you know, 40 people and I reached out to them in the DMs and, you know, I invited them to this event and no one came. I said, okay. So she, what did I do wrong? I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, how, tell me, just tell me how are you feeling when you were sending out all of those messages? She's like, what? I'm like, well, what were you feeling? She said, well, I was, I was worried. I was like, oh, am I bothering people? Are they thinking that I'm going to be, you know, you know, getting them to buy something? I didn't want to feel icky and all that. I said, that's why people didn't come. I said, if you showed up and you did those exact same actions, if you reached out on the DMs to people that you knew to come to this event and you were feeling that belief, that conviction, feeling 
so excited, couldn't wait to share this event because you knew it was going to be wonderful for them to attend, people would have come. And that's why we always go back to the thoughts and the feelings, who you're being, your attitude, because action alone is not going to work. And then we do action cubed because it's massive action. I say action cubed because it's not action sometimes. It's not action when you feel like it. It's not action inconsistently. It's massive action consistently with persistence. And so I, I actually had it made into some artwork behind me because I don't even use a whiteboard anymore with my clients. When I'm coaching my clients, we just use the formula. It works for everything. And so that's that's the story behind that. And it really, truly, to me, it's, it's the keys. It's the keys to how you create the results that you want. Yeah, I, I really like that idea about thoughts and feelings before action or the thoughts and feelings get expressed through your action. And I've been there too, Julie. I mean, I'm just about ready to kick off a public course. I do these courses for large corporations like IBM and Dell and Walmart Canada and whatever. And I had a lot of people say, gee, Park, how can I take the course if I'm not a member of a big group like that? And so I created a very affordable course for them. And we have an exclusive cohort. I mean, only 25 people. And to, as of this recording, I've got five seats left and it begins in a couple of days. And I got to tell you, Julie, I sometimes had that same thought and feeling when I was shooting those out. I'm going like, well, you know, on one hand, a lot of people are asking for this. So I am and should be expressing my excitement about that. But then it kicked into me. Gosh, I don't want to you know, I don't want to be bothering them. I don't want to sound like I'm coming off spammy. And I had to change my mindset. And I go, no, this is an opportunity that everybody's been asking for. And it's only 250 bucks. I mean, it's in, and people then that knew the program said, geez, dude, why are you charging so little for it? And I said, because I want to get it going and I want to get people. But I could see in some of my first emails that went out, my resistance, my scaredy catness of, offending people sounded in that. And it wasn't until I let that go and said, no, dude, and dude, that's out there. This is a great thing. And then I was excited about it. And I started having way more fun with my emails and boom, 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 boom. It started filling up just like that. So I, I, I love that thought and feeling. This made me smile like ear to ear because first, I love that you're real because this never goes away. Like, it's not like one day that all just goes away. So I just love that, you know, someone like yourself is sharing, like, that just means a lot to so many people that you're sharing that it happens to you too, you know? And I call it, like, managing your T's and F's, managing your thoughts and feelings. It's like every day, I always say that you have to self-coach yourself in the moments of almost every day to get to the results that you want. It's self-coaching. And I just love that you, that's, you just exhibited that you, you self-coached yourself you're like wait a minute no <laughs> right no and then your energy changed and what came through your conviction and your belief that that offer that you're cre that you've created is amazing and that's what people are buying they're buying your belief right they're buying that belief that's coming through in that email in your messages that's what they're buying they don't know what's on the other side of that course i always say people buy belief they don't buy the course. They don't buy the program. They can't know. It's almost like a brick wall. They can't know what's on the other side of that brick wall. They can't, they've never seen it. They haven't gone through it yet. So why are they giving you money? They're giving you money based on belief. And I just love that you just shared that because that's exactly what I, I always am sharing with our clients is that your emails have a, a frequency to them. Yeah. You know, I'm not super woo. But I'm woo enough. Like I, <laughs> there's an energy behind your emails. People feel it, whether they can, they can't put their finger on it. They just know. Yeah. And that belief comes through, and it requires us to self coach ourselves on the energy backing our actions. Because it really, really matters. Well, and it's about mindset. And you talk about well, share with us what is and what is not mindset in your world. Yeah, it's, you know, again, I'm like scratching my neck because I get itchy on this talking about it because it drives me crazy because I, I fell into this trap. I When I first became an entrepreneur, I was like, okay, I just need the perfect morning routine where I meditate and I have a, like, you know, chai tea and I journal and walk in nature barefoot. And then I'm going to have this business that explodes, right? It's like, 
the number of like morning routine, I, I fell into this. I probably listened to every podcast and read every book when I was first starting oh, yeah. on the perfect morning routine, right? And what what started, what I really started to understand is that, you know, and, I, and after all of my experience at IBM and in marketing, all that, I, I've coupled it with getting certified as a life coach and getting certified as a, as a mindset coach because I really wanted to bring those things together. And what I started to realize is that we've had this story in our mind that mindset is something that we work on in maybe a morning routine or that mindset is, you know, going to an event where we get inspired or whatever it's going to be, or listen to that podcast and that shifted my mindset. But mindset is not inspiration. It's not motivation. It's none of that mindset. And I, I, when I really like dug underneath the word, I love looking underneath words and what they mean. Mm -hmm. Mindset is really an established or entrenched, rooted system of beliefs, thoughts and beliefs. It's your it's your attitude. And an attitude is like the, all your thoughts and your beliefs that are so rooted that they actually form your attitude or your mindset. I'm sorry, but an inspiring podcast is not going to change deep rooted belief systems that are inside of you. So mindset to me is a lifelong journey that you're always evolving, but also you're doing it in the moments of the day. It's not just something you do in your morning routine. So we kind of talked about it. It's, it's managing your T's and your F's all the time. And what's fascinating is that this works wonders, not just in growing a business, but it's changed my relationships in my family. My, my middle son, Jack, he's 17. When he was younger, it, it was really challenging, you know, his behavior and all of these things. And I remember I used to cry on the floor of the kitchen, to be honest with you. It was really hard. And I started doing all this work around mindset and life coaching and certification back when he was younger. And I started applying it. And I started to actually start to manage myself rather than expect him to be different. And I started to coach myself on my thoughts and my feelings to respond versus react, to decide who I wanted to be and practice being that in the moment rather than who I tended to come out as because of my old mindset, dramatically changed my relationship with my son. He's now 17. We're so close. It's amazing. So to me, mindset is about being super intentional around who you want to be in the different areas of your life or business and then actually checking in and being so aware that you're managing those thoughts and feelings in the moment. It's hard work. That's mindset. That's doing the mindset work. It is every day, <laughs> all day long, not a morning routine. Okay, I'll come up the soapbox now, but that, I get so passionate about that. <laughs> well, and we all are raised by, you know, people that actually care for us, you know, for the most part. I know there are some people in very unfortunate circumstances out there as kids and whatever, but even the best of intentions by our parents can create these beliefs and mindsets in us that are not serving us. And, you know, of course, we know people well into their 60s, 70s, and 80s are still fighting these self-deteriorating mindsets and beliefs. And I imagine you probably see it a lot in your world too when you are coaching these women to really ignite their success is they've got to get rid of some of those beliefs because they're not in service to them or they're just simply not accurate. I hear that all the time on this, store, uh, this show. You know, I bring on very highly accomplished people because people want to hear, how'd you get there? And to a person, to a man and or woman guest on here, they had to overcome some sort of belief, value, mindset that was built into them at an early age that was not in service to them as they got older and got out into the world. How do you help people reprogram some of those beliefs so that they are truly living into a more powerful story? Well, the key is, you know, it's it's interesting, right? We we can't see the end of our own nose. <laughs> so often, that's how it is with limiting beliefs. We don't even know that they're there. Right. And so some of the biggest breakthroughs that I have encountered for myself is working with a coach so that I can see the end of my own nose. 
seeing things that I can't see. Now, they can't, a coach can't tell you, like, you know, what to do to, or, or what your limiting belief is. They can only help guide the inner work to get it out of you, right? So that's what we do. That's I've worked with coaches. That's what we do. It's in there. But here's the thing. It's not about going back and like, why is it there? Why do I think this way about money? Why do I think this way about myself? Why? It's not about that. It's about the way that we do it. We look at, well, who do you want to be? Let's write it. Let's write it fresh, right? You might have these limiting beliefs, but what do you want to believe? Yeah. So let's take money. Let's take leaving your corporate job and starting your own business. What do you want to believe? And we work on writing the beliefs that we want to have so that we can start actually practicing believing it. We actually have to practice believing it because guess how, guess what? That's how the, the, the ones that are limiting us got in there. Practice. We didn't realize it was practice, but it was time. Over time, hearing something enough, thinking it enough, it becomes habitual. It's just habitual thinking is all it is. So every once in a while, you could have a breakthrough where you change your thinking like that. Usually not very common. So it becomes this, it's this practice. It's kind of like my favorite Tom Brady he practiced to become who he is. He, he didn't throw, start throwing the ball like that. It's the same thing with, with our mental muscles. We have trained ourselves so long to think a certain way about whatever subject. It's about, let's like, and then what we do is we try to unpack, well, why do I think that? What, what made me think that? And, and we want to change the thing. We don't do that. We look at, well, what do I want to believe? But then we need to use the same process that got the one that we didn't want in there. Mm-hmm. It's got to be repetition. It's got to be practice. And so what we do, and it's really fun, we actually create a script, a story, if you will, of who, of how we want life to be, of what I want to believe, of what I want to be thinking and feeling, right? So we write this script. We have our, we have our clients actually then also record it so they can listen to themselves reading that script right? It's deeper than affirmations. It's like visualizing this themselves in this, 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 you know, believing this and doing these things. But here's the kicker. This is where it makes it, the, the, the practice kicks in. We talk about them practicing being her in the moments of the day. So practice being her in your kitchen. If you're working on relationships in your family, practice being her in your business if you're trying to grow a business practice being her in your career wherever it may be that's your inner guidance system and but we write it we're very clear on what does she believe what does she think what is she doing and so when i coach people i'm coaching them on the gap of who they're being right now to her yeah all that stuff's in there it got in there and it got in there because of repetition and time we got to use the same tools intentionally to shift who we're being and what we're thinking. So that's what we do. It's really, really powerful. And you know what? You used the word fun earlier. Fun is a core value for me. We have a lot of fun doing it, mm-hmm. right? Having fun, not so much pressure. Having fun practicing. I had to practice being an entrepreneur and moving from an c- employee mindset and who I was, all the thinking and the entrenched beliefs, right? I had to practice that. I had to practice being her before I became her. And that's that's what we do. You've got to believe in yourself, don't you? Um, can you share with us, and you can save the name or make up a name to you know protect the innocent, um, of a customer, client, or a friend that you've helped that came in with very limiting beliefs. They were playing off of, you know, playing from a poorly scripted life story and how your process of rewriting that script and getting them to believe in something bigger for themselves had that kind of impact for them. Yeah, I got teary-eyed just when you said it, just knowing exactly who I wanted to share about. But before I mention that story, it's, you know, because I work with women, I work with women on purpose because women, especially a lot of moms, there is deep rooted belief systems about what a good mom is and being a mom and not being able to be a mom and. And so we do a lot of work around that because there's a lot of limiting beliefs, especially still to this day with women. So that's big for me. But this particular woman, she's actually one of my oldest clients. She's 75. And when she came to me, she was, she was sad. She, she felt like, you know, kind of life, like, you know, you know, she missed the boat on certain things and, 
you know, she was widowed and she had previously gone through breast cancer. Her kids were grown. She had got grandchildren. She's 75. And, but she knew she had this, like, that her soul was telling her she wasn't done. Hmm. But her mind and all of her limiting beliefs were telling her, of course you are. You're 75. 75 year old women do not start businesses. 75 year old women don't invest in themselves in, you know, to develop their own businesses or to get a coach certification or any of these things. So a lot of chatter. And in working together, so proud of her, she decided she was going to rewrite what the rest of her life was going to look like. And she went on to get certified as a coach. She now has, like, I think she's got her first three or four clients. Like, this is all within the last year. Three or four clients that she's working with. She calls herself the Crossroads Coach because she's helping other women that are at that crossroads. So she's helping other women in that same boat where they're feeling like, all right, life is, is my life over? Like, it's all, you know, the, the best is behind me? And she's like, no, you know, and she's helping other women now do that. Like, the ripple effect is so cool. But she had to shift and we worked really hard on who did she need to become? What were some of the things she had to start thinking and feeling and how to practice that? In the past, when she was trying to do this, she just went right to the action. What do I need to do? And she actually had this other business she started for eight years that wasn't making really any money, wasn't very fulfilling because she just kept trying to do. What do I need to do? And she kept trying to do in the business. And when she started to step into being the version of her that she wanted to become, that's when everything shifted for her, right? She did all the work. I just, I'm just, co good coach is just a guide to help them have that come out from the inside out. But she had to really rewrite the script of what it means to be a 75-year-old woman who was retired, widowed, breast cancer survivor. What is the rest of her like? What's it, suppo what's it supposed to look like, right? And rewriting it. And people think she was crazy. Like, you're starting a business at 75? This is insane, right? That was the feedback that she was getting. And she had to really create new paradigms, new belief systems to be able to help herself be able to actually make it a reality. I mean, that is so cool. And you have kind of sometimes have to reframe that external story that's coming at you that is so loud and in some cases, obnoxious. For instance, you know, I ran in my ad agency, Park & Co., for 20 years in Phoenix, and I enjoyed it the first 10 years, did not enjoy it the second 10 years. And I said, I got to do something different. And I asked myself, what is it that I want to do? Well, I want to be able to travel the world with my business, and I want to help more people in communication. And I was really fascinated, of course, with storytelling in the early 2000s and was using it in my career. But I found that it was, I had way more fun, could make more money, and have way more of an impact if I was coaching and teaching people on how to use stories, you know, to excel through the stories you tell. That's my tagline. So, Julie, I literally closed my ad agency at when I was 55 years old, and people thought, why didn't you sell it, you idiot? And I'm going, because I would have been handcuffed to whoever bought it for the next five years with no guarantees. I would have now been 60. And I'm starting, you know, that's getting a little bit later in your final chapter of your career. So people looked at me cross-eyed, like, or like I was cross-eyed, and I just had to say, it's okay. Don't worry about it. We're fine. <laughs> so I use that as my off-ramp into the business of story and what I do now, and I have never been more fulfilled over the last seven years. But something else has happened recently, and I'm of that ilk that, you know, we're out, we're playing golf with folks my age or older. I just got off the, the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon with our two sons, Parker and Caden, and a lot of those people there were retired. So I will get that question, Julie, and maybe you get it as well. Oh, are you retired or do you still have to work? And what I do is I said, no, I'm not retired. I don't really feel like it. I, I'm working. What I do is reframe retired, and I tell them I'm re-energized. I'm not re-tired. <laughs> and a lot of times, especially from men, I will get a look of like, oh, my God, I wish I had what you had because I am retired and I'm bored out of my brains because I'm following the same script 
Everybody has always told me I'm supposed to follow. You know, occasionally you'll get someone saying, I've been retired for five years, and I love it. It's fantastic. But rarely. I'm going to say nine out of ten of these people will say, oh, that's so cool. How did you possibly set that up at your late age or whatever? But it is reframing that story and not buying into what the masses want you to believe is the proper path because everybody else is doing it. And honestly, I think that unhappiness starts to come in total comfort and it's an illusion that we're just, well, I'm comfortable. And I think like the whole retirement story is just a whole other, like we could do a whole other podcast episode yeah. on that. Cause it's just, we've, that, that's a story that needs to be rewritten because there's a lot of people that are not happy because why is kind of what we talked about earlier. We're meant to grow. We're like always meant to grow and expand. And when we stop, it's not, we're not standing still. We're starting to shrink. We're meant to grow and expand. And it's, you know, I, I just, that pains me because it's, it, we look weird, you know, because we're, we're kind of bucking the system, <laughs> but like, you know, I've never been more alive and happy in my life. I'm 48 and I like, people look at me and like, Oh, I'm going to be hitting 40 or I'm hitting 50 and I'm thinking, and I'm not happy. And I always say that I've never been happier mm -hmm. in my entire life so far. And it's coming from creating. It's coming from this growth and this expansion. And I think that as humans, that's what we're meant to do. So hopefully we're helping others see that this, this can be the new norm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Julie, this has been absolutely magnificent. Thanks for coming on the show. Where can people learn more about you and your great work? Yeah, well, if you're a female entrepreneur, definitely check out the podcast. It's called Ignite Her Mind. I love podcasting as well. It's a great place to check out more and maybe binge some of the stuff that I'm sharing here where I go in deeper. And I'd love to love to welcome you over to my show. And I think you're going to be coming on my show too. So I'm excited about I'm that. I'm looking forward to it. And you've hosted your show for what, five years now? Five years this summer. Yeah. It's a lot of work, but isn't it so rewarding? Because I know in my world, I get to meet amazing people just like you and we get a chance to chat for a little bit. One of my favorite parts is the podcasting. It's so fun. <laughs> well, thanks again. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Park, so much. It's been so, so great being here. Hey, and thank you all for listening to and watching this edition of The Business of Story. If you liked what you heard, please share this episode with your friends, family, colleagues, anyone you might know that maybe is struggling a little bit or not fulfilling their potential because they are bought into old beliefs old ways of doing things and as julie said just simply need to find someone like herself to help rewrite that script and then become the protagonist become your own hero in your hero's journey and it's not easy and it's scary and it's gonna throw a lot of obstacles in your way but you know what that's the only way you're gonna grow as she said and we are built as homo sapiens to be continuously growing. My mother's 98 years old. She still plays cards every week with her girlfriend. She plays poker once a month with like my old principal from my junior high school. She is a voracious reader. And you know what? She is brilliant. She has all of her faculties. Her body's in pretty good shape and she still lives in the same home on the same 12 acres that her and my dad raised us seven kids. And why? Is because she never stopped growing. And I just think it's a great lesson for all of us. And that's why I love this episode so much today. Now, if I can help you grow as a business storyteller, then of course, you know what to do. Come on over to the business of story. If you were unable to take advantage of my mastery course, you can still do the online course at businessofstory.com forward slash ABT. Hope you'll come and join me there. And don't forget to come on back next Monday when we will have another amazing story artist right here for you like Julie. And until then, remember that the most potent story you'll ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make sure that is epic. Thanks so much for listening.